All right, well, welcome everybody to this uh, presentation on how to use the SharkBridge Teacher Console. Thanks so much for coming. Um, to help us get a sense of what type of information you're looking for tonight, I'm gonna ask you to uh, take this quick poll. I, I love these Zoom polls. Um, so just looking to see if you're brand new to teaching with Shark or you have some experience and also if you're geared, if we are gonna be geared towards teaching pure beginners or current bridge players. Okay, so let me end this poll and share the results. So we definitely have a mixture. Um, so I'm going to uh, gear some of this presentation uh, to teachers who have never tried teaching with Shark. Uh, hopefully those that have tried it a few times uh, will get some, some uh, helpful knowledge out of it as well. And the teachers who have taught many classes, maybe you can help me uh, with the, the answers. And um, I see that uh, we've got 41% teaching all or mostly beginners, another 42% teaching a mix. I think Shark Bridge is absolutely fantastic for teaching pure beginners. It's great for teaching all levels. Um, but uh, my team and I have taught close to 300 beginners online in the past year, and it's, it's worked really well. So I just want to have a couple of brief introductions. Uh, first, to tell you who I am. Uh, my name is Kim Gilman. I'm a bridge teacher in the Boston area. Um, and I... Uh, a year and a half ago, I was just a small time bridge teacher teaching a few classes and I feel like I got caught up in this huge wave of COVID-19 and um, the demand for online bridge classes skyrocketed. I'm sure like many of you, you kind of felt like if you were in the right place at the right time, in a way we almost benefited from having all this demand for online classes. I feel like the one thing I maybe did right was when I saw the first demonstration of this teacher console back in June of 2020, I said, yeah, I want that. And when I started using it full time in the fall of 2020, the students just really loved it. Um, you know, there was a lot of word of mouth. Uh, I had students come out of the woodwork, uh, have, have had really nothing but positive feedback. So uh, really enthusiastic to get more teachers fully engaged with this. I think it's good for teaching beginners, which is good for bridge and good for keeping bridge players engaged until we can get back to playing in person, which is really my preference. Uh, I really wish I could play bridge in person, uh, but I think even when we get back to that point that online learning and online teaching is gonna be here to stay because it, it has so many advantages. Um, so I wanna make sure everybody knows the developers and leaders at Shark Bridge. So I wanted to ask Milen and Plamen to introduce themselves also. <laughs> okay, I'll start. Uh, hello, Milen. Uh, most of you probably know me. Most, well, a lot of you have talked to me. Uh, I'm the lead developer of uh, this effort to bring uh, online teaching to, to the online world. And uh, we are very happy with uh, how things are turning and uh, the response that we get from students is the critical for us. And uh, that seems to be an overwhelmingly positive. So tonight, uh, we're very thankful for Kim to spare her time to show you how uh, efficient classes can be run and that it's not that hard to do with chat. So I'll pass along for my Plamen. favorite facts. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Plamen, the other co-founder of Shark Bridge. In brief, a long time bridge enthusiast with a background in managing different business products. Since 2011, I with Milan, we are engaged in developing bridge products for a different company. And right now, the culmination of our work will be demonstrated here by Kim. 
Thank you, Plum. And whenever I see your background, I always think that is the actual Shark Bridge control room. <laughs> it's <laughs> not, is it? Okay. All right. Um, I also want to say that um, teaching online has been very much a team effort. Uh, several of my assistants are here tonight, um, and it, it has helped in so many ways to have volunteers, especially as we've tried to get students familiar with this technology. I couldn't do it without them. And I also could not do it without Malen and Plum and answering their text messages and emails at the drop of a hat. Um, they are incredibly supportive. So um, if you're feeling some trepidation about starting your first class using the Shark Console, uh, make sure you're in touch with these guys. You know, they'll, they'll attend your classes and help you get started and walk you through it. They've done that for me numerous times. Uh, I could not have done it without them, but this is a very responsive, company that uh, has great tech support. Um, okay, so usually my classes are in two parts, as we discussed a little bit before class started, where I would do a presentation here on Zoom, sharing some slides with some of the concepts, uh, and then transitioning over to uh, the classroom for students to practice and play. So I'm going to share a couple of the slides I use. What you're looking at now is part of a pre-class technology training that I do with students. So I wouldn't want uh, first-time students, uh, and that includes all beginners, to try to figure out how to um, use Zoom and the Bridge Classroom, especially at the same time, without giving them a little training. So like many teachers who are using Shark Bridge, um, you're probably inviting your students to like, you know, a 30 minute technology rehearsal sometime before class number one. And I, I show them slides like this where I'm literally saying, uh, we're going to use a program called Zoom and we're going to use your internet browser. And I take them through that and kind of explain the two programs. Now, I found that students are a lot more tech savvy now than they were a year and three months ago. So my technology rehearsals aren't as difficult they don't last as long. The students graduate a lot faster, but I still want to have them practice uh, going into the classroom. So I usually show them a slide like this, which uh, uh, I'll say you're going to get a, a link in the chat and we practice using the chat. I make them send messages to me and confirm that they can see my messages. And then I say, when it's time to play Bridge Hands, you're going to get a link, you're going to click on it, and this is what you're going to see. And I talk them through how to log in and how important it is to press this continue button. Uh, when I teach beginners, um, I may show them what an actual real life bridge game looks like. And I go over who, you know, north, south, east, and west, and the dummy and the bidding boxes. And then I'll show them how this translates into the two dimensional bridge table and what they're going to see. Uh, when they start playing bridge, um, showing them the dummy on this one. So um, all of us have our own systems and our, our own approach to teaching beginners, but this is where you can start teaching them some of the basics, some of the, the mechanics um, before they actually play their first cards. Um, okay, this is going back to the technology training aspect. Now, um, the absolute best, um, the best type of class in Shark is a declare or play class because you put one student per table with three robots and every student gets to declare every hand and it's fabulous and, and they, they love that. And I was just thinking this afternoon about teaching a declare or play class to a country club group that wants me to come teach in person. And I'm like, nah, and I just threw it out. I'm, I'm going to do something else because in person, in a declare a play class, declarers usually get to play one deal if they're lucky. And I'm thinking now, look, if you want to learn, if you want to take a declare a play bridge lesson, it's really got to be online so you can play every single hand. But I've also taught uh, bidding classes and defense classes and beginner classes, and all these require a partner. And even in a beginner class, you're going to get some married couples who want to play together. And so you really got to teach them how to log in as partners. Um, so whatever your system is, um, whatever works for, for different teachers is fine. I tell them first name, last initial, and I show them an example 
um, and, and kind of have them rehearse that. I show them what the screen looks like once you hit continue and what it'll look like once you get some cards. Um, and then, uh, you know, I can do my, you know, I, I can do the, um, the, the content, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I can, I can show them example hands and summaries and, and what have you. So I'm not going to do that with today's class, but just, just an example of what I might do in a presentation, uh, both before the first class in terms of the technology orientation, and then during class, you can show any number of these types of slides. Um, and it, it can be interactive if you want to show your students a bridge hand, ask them, what would you bid with this, for example, or a bridge hand saying, what would you lead? What would your opening lead be? Ask them to send you their answers in the chat, and so they get a little bit of a little bit of interactivity there. For the next twenty minutes or so, um, we're going to have a little mini bridge class where you are going to be the students, uh, and it's going to be a declare a play class. I am going to. Get the classroom open and ready for you. And then I'm going to get ready to put the link into the chat. And we can get logged in. And so from this point forward, uh, you're going to be a student. And you get to experience this from the student perspective. And then when we're finished that, I'm going to take you behind the scenes, as Malen calls it, the kitchen of the teacher console and show you all the buttons and controls that you'll use to pull this off. OK, so I have now uh, put the link into the Zoom chat, so you should be able to click on that. Make sure you do not give yourself a partner, OK, because I want you to be alone at your table. Now, since this is a declare a play class, you'll see as you get your bridge table that um, that the auction has already been done. So I do not usually have bidding in a declare a play class, nor in a defense class. Um, I want in declare a play, I want them to concentrate on playing. And in a defense class, I want them to concentrate on defending. Uh, but I will show the auction. I'll sometimes talk about it. It seems like students always get focused on bidding. Even if it's not a bidding class, they always want to know, how could you possibly bid this way? And sometimes my answer is, just go along with it if you wouldn't mind. I just, I just threw in an auction there so you'd have to play in six spades. It might not make any sense, but there it is. Your partner bid crazy. Now you got to try to make the contract. All right, so this is how I might teach. Um, once the students have a bridge hand, this is going to be uh, a demo hand. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say to you, uh, you're in six spades, and there's going to be an opening lead. And while you're studying the dummy, I want to call your attention to the chat function at your table. So. If you look to the left of your cards, there's a blank space where it should say type your message. And the question I'm going to be asking you uh, is if you're going to trump this lead. If you're going to play the two of spades, yes, or uh, if you're going to play some other card. Now, when you answer, there are two different ways to chat at the table. If you just type your message and hit enter or return on your keyboard, that chat goes to everyone at your table. Now here, it's the robots. They do not process your chat. Um, but if you were playing with a partner or if you were playing with a foursome, you could chat amongst yourselves at the table. And the other tables don't see your chat. However, I do. The teacher sees all the chat messages. And sometimes that can be overwhelming for the teacher because you see so much chatter back and forth. So I like my students to use the little question mark symbol and the paper airplane. So again, where you see the space, type your message. 
uh, write write your message. So now you're saying yes or no. Basically, you're going to say yes, I trump it. Yes, I trump this, or no, I don't. And I want you to, after you type your message, I want you to click the question mark symbol. And then that other little symbol, it's supposed to be a paper airplane, I believe. It's kind of pointy. And when you do that, the teacher gets the messages in a special area. So I get to see your answers. Um, and it doesn't get interspersed with the uh, messages such like, uh, you know, how was your week, Jane? Do you want to play on Saturday, Bill? You know, stuff like that that tends to go on amongst the students. So if you wouldn't mind, yes, are you going to trump this or no, are you not going to? Yes or no. And if you can, click on the question mark and then the paper airplane. Uh, okay, well, I'm actually getting uh, mixed responses here. So I, I want to talk to you all about loser on loser plays. We're in a slam and we need to figure out uh, how we're going to take 12 tricks, or another way to look at it is how to avoid two losers. And when I go suit by suit, looking at it from perhaps the perspective of our hand, the south hand, uh, I could trump all three diamonds. Absolutely, I could trump all three diamonds, so potentially no diamond losers. Clubs, I have a singleton, no problem. Hearts is my problem because if my finesse loses, if I play a heart from dummy and put in the queen and it loses to the king, the problem is that I have another heart loser, right? I have the four of hearts, which is also a loser. And if I, so it seems like if I lose the heart finesse, I'm going to lose not one, but two tricks. And I will go down. So is there a better way? And because of this diamond lead, we have been given the potential of winning a trick with the king of diamonds, right? So suppose we decline to trump this. Either the opponent is going to take their ace, setting up our king, or they won't take their ace. Maybe opening leader has the ace for some strange reason, and we will win our king. But the principle here is that since we have a loser anyway in the small heart, even if our heart finesse were to win, this card here, the five of hearts, is still a loser. And now I'm, I'm playing the cards for you. So I could concede a trick that I otherwise could have trumped. So I'm going to lose this trick, <laughs> but in so doing, I'm putting that five of hearts on there, which was I'm going to lose anyway. So this is the loser on loser. And as you're going to see in a moment, by using this loser on loser, I'm going to get a trick back. So it's really just an incredible bargain. All right. So I've thrown off my five of hearts, which is a loser, and they take their ace. So yes. I'm losing this trick. OK, so the next thing they do, it could be very, it would really put me to the test. They could return a heart if they wanted to. Since I've already lost one trick, I really don't want to take this finesse. So I'm going to take my ace. All right, and I'm going to quickly draw trumps. And then I'm going to take that king of diamonds. This is the trick that I promoted. I let them take their ace when maybe I didn't have to, but it set up my king. So now I play my king of diamonds and I throw away my other heart. All right, and I'm going to show you all four hands. So in terms of what's left, I have three spades in dummy. I can trump my queen of hearts, my four of hearts, and my eight of diamonds. I can trump those three cards. 
and then play the ace of clubs and the slam is made with only one loser. And as you can see, if I hadn't made that play, let's see, I'm trying to get this back to the beginning for you. If I hadn't made that play of the loser on loser, if I had trumped that diamond and taken the heart finesse, not only would I have lost one heart, I would have lost two hearts. So that's the general principle. Instead of trumping, perhaps let that trick go if it sets up a winner for you eventually, if it promotes a trick, if you have a loser to throw off. So I'm going to let you try this now on the next hand. All right, so you're in a five diamond contract. You can see that your left hand opponent overcalled one spade and your partner cubid two spades showing diamond support. And you decided boldly to go to five diamonds. And the opening lead is going to be the ace of spades. And I'm gonna give you a few minutes now to play. So make a plan. Oh, hold on. Hold on, let me just play the first trick for you because what's going to happen when they take their ace of spades is that your queen is going to drop and the defense thinks better of continuing. They don't want to continue with spades anymore. So they switch to the jack of hearts. Okay, so uh, you can only lose one more trick. I'll give you a couple minutes to play. You should be able to play your cards. Some of you have found the claim button underneath your cards. You may have also noticed an undo button. So if a student chooses the wrong card, they can, they can correct it. The beginners really appreciate having that undo button. <laughs> they, they do not use the claim button, obviously. Okay, so I'm gonna stop you where you are. Sorry if you're not quite finished yet. And what I wanna do is bring everybody back to the same point where we were at trick two and the opponent had led the ace of spades, right? So we lost the ace of spades, our queen fell under it, and then they switched to the jack of hearts. Um, and so now I'm showing you all four hands and I'm going to show you how to make this contract. So from what I could see, most of you did make this contract, but just for the sake of demonstrating how this works from the student's perspective, as the teacher, you know, suppose that they, you know, a lot of them didn't make the contract. So you can now replay it for them. And I would talk them through it a little bit. I would say, well, we've lost the ace of spades. And what are our other potential losers? Well, the trump suit is solid. In the heart suit, we have the ace and king, but we have one loser. And in the club suit, we have the ace and king. And we have a possible loser, right? We could finesse our jack of clubs. Uh, or maybe there's some kind of end play available. Um, but it's quite possible we could have a club loser um, if we don't have an end play or a successful finesse with the club suit. So looking at two possible losers, Perhaps what we can do is set up one of those spades, right? Remember the ace and queen of spades are already gone. If we could get rid of the king of spades, then our jack or our 10 could become a good trick. So that's going to be our plan. I'm going to win this heart in my hand. And I will just draw trumps real quick. There's no reason not to here. Okay, so now I have to go over to the dummy and I have to, I have to lead one of those spades. So uh, I, could have got, I could have been there right now on the king of diamonds, but I didn't do it. Okay, well, I'll go over on the ace of clubs. So I'm still safe in the club suit. Okay, and here's my loser on loser. I'm gonna lead the jack of spades. Now I could trump it, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to throw away 
my heart loser. Okay, now this trick is going to lose, right? I just lost my jack of spades to the king. That's a loser. But I threw off the four of hearts, which was a loser anyway. Nothing lost. And in this incredible bargain, I have now picked up the 10 of spades as an extra winner. So suppose they continue with the heart. I win it. And I take this beautiful 10 of spades and I throw off my club loser. And now, as you can see, the rest of the tricks are yours. And at this point, I would probably let you see the whole hand again, bring it back to the beginning, ask for any questions. I'm not going to do that now because our, our main goal here isn't necessarily to make you experts with loser on loser plays. And again, I think a lot of you already know this anyway. But this would be a good point where you could ask the students to type their questions into the chat and you could answer some as you as you choose or, or not. OK, now I'm going to show you something kind of cool, um, which is I'm going to put you together as partners to bid a hand just so you get the experience of bidding. Now, if this were a regular class, you would already be signed in with the partner of your choice. But just to demonstrate this to you, I'm just going to seat you with a random person. And I'm going to have you bid the next hand. And then I'm going to separate you again so everybody will get to declare. All right, so this is random. You can say hello to the person sitting across from you. And I'm going to bring up the next hand for you. And this time, the auction is not going to be there. OK, so I'm going to have you guys bid this. And what I've done is set this up so that you stop um, when the bidding is over. Nothing happens. Nobody makes an opening lead. So in a bidding class, I can then take control of your table once more. And I can explain how I think the bidding should have gone. So I'm sorry if you're not quite done bidding yet. Most of you are. I'm going to take it back to the beginning with no bidding. I'm going to go ahead and let the North and South players see each other's cards. But I'm not going to show you the opponent's cards because you're going to end up playing this. And I would now just talk the students through. And I would say a typical auction might be North has a balanced hand uh, with 17 points, so they open one no trump. And South should probably use a Texas transfer, right? South knows that hearts will be trump and has just enough to insist on game. So South could bid four diamonds, which is a transfer to hearts. And it's saying uh, one of two things. It could say, partner, I want to go to slam. Or if South now passes, it says I had just enough for game and nothing more. All right, so as the teacher, I have put you all in the same contract, which is four hearts by north. So uh, now you're going to play. Um, hint, this does involve a loser on loser play. Okay, so it just takes a second for everybody to get back to the north seat. And the opening lead is a fourth best spade. OK, so we'll stop here. I want to I want to get to the, the, the back room here. I want to show you the, the kitchen works. Um, but let me go ahead and, and uh, sync this back to the point where they led that low club. Uh, somebody asked me, how how did I get them to lead a low club at every table? So the simple answer is that what I do at the teacher's table is replicated exactly at every student's table. So when I want the robots to do to play certain cards, I play those cards myself on the teacher's table, and then that is replicated at every student's table. OK, so I'm going to end the lesson because I really want to show you the controls. Um, so what's going to happen now is that I'm going to close uh, the classroom. You're all going to be kicked off your tables. And you should be looking at me on Zoom. I want to thank Eddie Cantar, uh, the famous bridge writer and player uh, who has 
put into the public realm um, most of the material available on Loser on Loser Plays. Uh, if you're a member of the ABTA, American Bridge Teachers Association, uh, they now have some, some lesson deals available to teachers for downloading. So I got some of these deals there um, along with some explanations. So it's a great lesson there on Loser on Loser and Plays along with a bunch of other great lessons from Eddie Cantar uh, free for you to use if you're a member of the ABTA. Um, and I use a lot of Eddie Cantar's materials in my classes. He just does a great job of creating hands and writing them up. Okay, so now let's take a look at, so you have the teacher's console, you open it up and this is what it looks like. And before you start a class, the first thing we need to do is to get some bridge hands for the students to play. So we're gonna start out in my deal library. So I have a lot of, I have a lot of deals in my library that I've been using over the past year. Um, so, but let's say you have created some deals, some lesson deals for your students, and you, you're going to load them up into your Shark library. So, uh, I mean, you can create hands here uh, if you want to, if you want to formulate your own hands, you know, I can start doing that, uh, but uh, I don't like to do that. I use a different program. I use Dealmaster Pro to create my hands. Uh, other people use Bridge Composer, um, and, or you may be able to download PBNs from sources that provide lesson hands, for example, through the ABTA. Uh, but say I, I need to import a new set of deals. So I've got a bunch of PBNs. This platform will also take LIN files, L-I-N, which is what comes out of BBO. So if you create hands in BBO and export them, you would get an L-I-N file. So I can click down here and I can get some LIN files as well. They both work equally well. So I'm going to choose, um, let's see, how about new minor forcing week one? All right, so I'll just select that and I can double click it or open it. And then I see my deals. So I happen to have 16 deals in that set and I can go through and just check them. I can scroll through and see that I have my hands and the auction associated with that hand if I made it is in there too. So it's all here. Okay, and now I can just go back. So we've got the deals loaded for our class. So now we're gonna start a session. And um, generally when you start a session, the program is gonna create a link for you, a link that you can give your students. Uh, the very end of the link will be your access code. You can make this access code anything you like. I'm going to make my movie star for right now. Sometimes you, you could use your name or something easy to remember. Um, it works really well if you have co-hosts because they need, they need an access code they can enter. Um, so if you have a co-teacher or an assistant, um, they can come in and share their, the view of the whole teacher operation and the teacher console. They can read off messages. Um, call your attention to important questions. Um, they can also help out at individual tables. So if you have an assistant, uh, you, can, you can let them in. If not, just uncheck that. So I'm gonna allow co-hosts here. All right, and then we're going to connect. And before we can do anything at all, we need to add a table. So you only need to ever add one table. There may be times when you want to add a whole bunch of tables and I'll get to that. But even if you have 50 or 100 students, all you need to do is add one table. And every time a new student comes on, it's enough tables will be added to accommodate those students. That takes place automatically. So just add the one table. And also on this add table screens, you have a choice of all kinds of different features. In a bidding class, again, I like to have them have the program stop them once the contract is reached. And since I see my, my partnerships north-south, I like to let them see their partner's hand so they can start to figure out if they bid correctly. In a declare a play class, huh, the students love this one, allow replay. 
So, you know, they, they go down in the first four tricks and they want to try again. So there's a button at the student table. If you enable it, right, you don't have to let them play it over and over. But if you enable that button, they would be able to, to click replay and have another try at it. And the students absolutely love that. Um, another button that's kind of interesting is no dummy. And we can use this for beginner classes. When you're trying to show somebody how to follow suit, how to play a trick, you know, in the very first bridge class, if you want all four students to play their own cards, you can disable the dummy. That would probably be about the only time. Um, there's something here called guided play. So if you have a small class uh, where you want your students to just play four boards uninterrupted, and then maybe talk about it with them afterwards, or maybe just go from table to table and chat with your students. This guided play would just allow your students to themselves go on to the next board. If you don't do this, the teacher has to bring up the next board. I have never actually used this. Um, I, I like to control when the students are gonna play their next board, but this would be kind of a supervised play thing where they can go at their own pace and you give them a whole set of deals right up front. Okay, so we're gonna take that off. Uh, I'm gonna do stop a contract. So they only play when I tell them to play. And yeah, let, let them see each other's cards once they finish bidding. So if you want the robots to bid as you think they should bid, click this bidding hints from library and the robots will follow what what they're supposed to do. Okay, now, um, one thing I want to say before I go any further um, is that you can practice this uh, on your own. So I'm, I am going through this a little bit quickly. Um, fortunately, we have a recording, but I also want to emphasize that once you have this program on your computer, you can log in anytime and you can fool around with these buttons. Uh, you can create fake students. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Or you can just use the robots. Um, but I did not learn this in an hour, believe me. I practiced quite a few times. It doesn't cost you anything to practice with this. So uh, I would encourage you to set aside some time before you start teaching um, and just open up your SharkBridge console, start a session, and, and see what all these buttons do. <laughs> Play around with it, get some robots in as students, see what they do, see what happens at the teacher's table, et cetera. Okay, so you don't have to learn everything right this minute. I'm just kind of showing you what's here and encouraging you to spend some time um, just having this up on your computer and, and playing with it, basically. Okay, so I'm gonna add a table. All right, and these are the steps that I'm trying to accomplish before I let the students come into the classroom. So sometimes I, I am not very good at operating this console and teaching at the same time. So usually I'll say, okay, students, give me just a moment to get the classroom set up for you. And then I'll give you the link to, to log in. And there are basically three things that I have to do once I start the session. I have to add the table. I have to get my first deal loaded up because when they get to the table, I don't want them to see a blank table. I want them to see cards. And I'm gonna put, I'm gonna select the first hand and I'm gonna put it up there for them. I'm gonna come back to this in a second. All right, so now they have a bridge hand at their table and then I'm gonna decide where they sit. Okay, so here, this is my control panel and this box here, auto seat students, will let you decide where to put them. Now, again, in a beginner's class, I think four per table is perfectly reasonable because you know they don't need to declare every hand. They need to figure out how to play their cards and follow suit. Um, in a slightly more advanced class, we can put them two per table so they get all the good cards to bid with or defend with. Um, since uh, most of my classes have predetermined partnerships, I normally select this one, partners north-south, singles unseated. That way the partners get set at tables and then I can see who the singles are and I can pair them up and put them at tables. 
Okay, so I've done the three things to get this ready. I've opened the session and created tables. I've give them, given them a deal and I've decided where they're gonna sit. So at this point, students, I believe we have some volunteers um, and I'd like you to go ahead and join us. All right, so what's happening now um, in this player list is that we're seeing who the students are. And let's see, Jane Fonda, Jane Fonda's partner is now here, Emma Stone, okay. So I've got seven students and unfortunately, Elaine doesn't have a partner. So here's where I'm gonna need to create another table. So I'm gonna add one table. Oh, okay, so now there are a couple of people. So uh, the way that I'm gonna seat these players who are not at a table, is that I'm going to click on their name. And then I'm going to go over, oh, I've gotta add another table now. Sometimes it's better to add four or five tables. Let's do that in just in case. Okay, let me get down to a, an empty table here and let's put, so I've clicked on it and then I click on the seat I wanna put them in. All right, I'm now clicking on Kevin Hart and I'm putting him in the south seat at table six. By the way, you also have the option for a kibitzer. Let me just zoom in. I'm gonna use these zoom in buttons so that the tables look a little bit bigger. Here we go. Let's look at a student table here, a little bit larger. All right, if I wanted somebody to be a kibitzer, let's, let's take uh, Gillian Anderson. And instead of having her playing with David Duchovny, let's put her in as a kibitzer uh, at Jimmy and Helen's table. So I'm just gonna click on her name and I'm going to go right here to kibitz at table one. So you can't actually see her here at the table, but over here in the student list, I can see that Jillian Anderson is a K, is a kibitzer at table three. All right, and now I'm gonna move her back to table one, clicked on her name, and then I'm clicking where she belongs. Um, so you move your students around by clicking on them in the student list and then clicking the seat that you want them to be in if you have to seat individuals. So let me zoom out here a little bit. Now, when you first start operating your teacher console, it might look different than this because you could set up all these different control panels in whatever configuration you like. So for example, let's take the player list. I can move this around and set it anywhere on my screen and I can make it bigger. So right now I can't really see all 11 students, but if I want to, I can expand this Again, this takes this just takes some playing around. Okay, so now I can see all 11 students and I might decide that uh, this is what I wanna see. It's more, this is more important to me to see this as opposed to anything else. So I'll have it just take up some extra room on my screen. So this is another thing you'll wanna spend some time with deciding how to configure all your various control panels and where to put them. Uh, once you get it set up, uh, when you end your session and log in again the next time, it will be saved, right? So this is not how I usually have it because I have a 26 inch monitor that I use in my classes and I put all these student tables up on the big monitor. So I can sort of get a, a much better overview of my student tables and then I have another whole screen to uh, use the controls on. So that's really handy. Uh, but if you don't have that, you can do it all on one screen. As you can see, you just have to make everything a little bit smaller so you can see everything you need and still use the teacher table. Okay, so um, our students are here. They're ready to play a deal. This is gonna be a, uh, I think a stamen hand. So let's go to the teacher's table which is where we control everything. Now you can see the teacher's table here is kind of blue and, the, and it's uh, out in front and the student tables are in the background. I've made the mistake sometimes of 
clicking on a student table thinking I was controlling everybody when in fact I was controlling only that one table. In fact, let me move that out of the way. So I can go to table one here and I can make North bid two hearts if I want to, but that doesn't change anything at the other tables, okay? With the teacher's table, anything I do, and I'm gonna bid one no Trump, as you can see, is playing out at every table. So whether I play a card, whether I make a bid, anything I do on the teacher's table is exactly repl replicated at every student table. So when it comes time, when it's time to show them the correct bidding and the correct play, basically they're watching their own table, their own cards, the entire deal play out as you wish them to see it. So this teacher's table is used a lot. I'm gonna make it as big as I can here. Um, again, you, you can do this also. Uh, there we go. So I want you to see the teacher's table. Okay. All right, so normally what I would do is I would just, I would go back to the beginning. Let's assume we're at the beginning, I hadn't done anything. And I wanna say to the students uh, who are now taking a class on stamen, all right, students, uh, the first hand is ready for you to bid. North is the dealer. I click start play and I run the robots because we need the robots uh, to pass uh, or to bid if that is the case. Um, so let's have the students here uh, go ahead and bid. And, and I'll, I'll move this teacher's table out of the way here and we can kind of scroll through the tables and watch their progress. Now I've got some empty tables here. Okay, so I'm kind of watching my tables, kind of getting a sense. I'm just kind of scrolling through them and seeing what progress they're making. And I can kind of gauge how much more time they need. And then the tables turn red when the bidding is complete. So that also helps you see. What I wanted to do, I have some empty tables here. I want to close this. So uh, I have, I, I, you know, remember when I added like 10 tables to have room to put my students on? I want to get rid of these now. So I, there's a command here, remove all empty tables. I'm just going to get rid of those. Okay, good. So now I only have students. I only have tables with students at them. Okay, so everybody has finished this hand. So I go to my teacher's table. And um, some, sometimes people might still be bidding. I'm going to click stop play. Uh, replay will take it back to the beginning. So watch this. Okay, here's my teacher's table. As you can see, there's some different contracts. I'm going to hit replay. And now the auction goes back to the very beginning at all tables. And now I will say students, North would open one no trump. South has two four card majors, yada, yada, yada. I show them the stamen auction. And I say South has enough for game, so we end up in four hearts. And now if I want the declarer to actually play it, I can say start play. And if there are robots involved at any of the tables, I have to hit run robots. By the way, let's suppose I stop the play. Sorry, students. Hitting run robots will automatically start the play also. So that, that button can do both at once. All right, so let's just have the students play out a few cards. So now I'm kind of watching them play. Now, one thing that one thing you can do, uh, see, I want to kind of zoom in on a student table. So I'm going to I'm going to zoom my student tables in so we can see one a little bit better. All right, let's let's go to uh, Helen and Jimmy here. Uh, if I want to send them a message, I can go right in here to their message area. Uh, and I can give them a little hint if I want to. <laughs> I'm not the best typist. 
All right, so I've just sent a message to that table. I've suggested maybe they draw trumps. I can also chat to the entire class at once if I want to through the chat, but I'm usually just speaking out loud. All right, and uh, if, there's, if there's one or two tables that are really slow and kind of holding everybody up and I can see that most people are done, I'll just say, okay, um, let's take another 30 seconds and then I'm gonna stop you. Now these zoom in and zoom out buttons allow you to control, let's do no zoom, right? That's just kind of the standard size of these student tables. If you wanna see more of them in one view, we can kind of zoom them out. So I'm kind of seeing uh, all my tables a little bit more easily. Okay, so let's just assume they have finished playing or most of them have finished playing. So back to my teacher's table. All right, now uh, I'm gonna stop them. I, I like to have them stop when I start talking. If I were to hit replay, this would take it back to the very beginning where there's not even an auction or anything. If I want to pick it up at this point where the auction is completed and I just want to talk about the play, I could use this command up here, sync all tables. And that will just bring it back to whatever point the master table is at. All right, so watch the student tables. Okay, so I have brought it back to the beginning, but the auction is still there. Uh, okay, and now um, let's see, what did the robot lead? Uh, maybe they led their fourth best club. Uh, I can hit show all cards. The students like to see all four hands at the point that I'm showing them the correct play. By the way, um, on the student tables, um, you can tell what cards they can see or not by the little card symbol at their table. So let's zoom in on this again. Do you notice here how it looks like there's a turned up queen of hearts next to north and all four players have their cards turned up? Uh, I can hide their cards, okay? And now you're seeing the backs of the cards. If I wanna go to an individual table and turn up north and south, I can just click on the backs of the cards either way, all right? But usually in a larger size class, I don't really have time to do individual things at individual tables. So I would control who sees what from the teacher's table and that would affect every table. So hide cards, show all cards. Sometimes in the course of your lesson, you'll want to show all of your students a certain hand uh, and then hide the hand again. For example, if you're going over the bidding and you want everybody to see north and south, you can reveal north and south to everybody by using the same function here of turning over the cards on your teacher's table. So now when I do this, everybody can see the north-south cards. And when I want to hide them again, I just click again. Perhaps you would like everyone at the table to contemplate the opening lead. And if East is on lead, you could turn up the East cards and ask everybody to consider what their lead should be. And once that's been decided, you could make the lead and turn it over again. So again, uh, lots of different choices about replaying, where to bring it back to, either the very beginning or bring it back to the auction, or perhaps a few tricks have been played. And if they're at a different stage, again, you can sync all tables and bring everybody back to right where you are. Okay, so we've won the opening lead and I'll show them about drawing trumps, et cetera. And as you can see, what I'm doing at the teacher's table plays out at every table. Okay, so I wanna show you just a couple more things um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Loading up your deals, some options here. All right, so here's the load deals button. And this, this button here is what allows me to control which hand they're going to play at any given time. So again, if I wanna load one deal at a time and just choose which deal I want them to play next, I just highlight it. 
Okay, so if I want to do deal eight in the book, I'll just select that one. I can see it, make sure it's the right one. And then I'm just going to click play. If I don't want them to bid, but I only want them to declare or defend, I can click play preset auction. Okay, and then the student will get the hand with the auction already there. Okay, this can be very handy if you're teaching beginners who don't know how to bid yet and you just want them to work on play of the hand. Uh, you can just play a preset auction. Sometimes I'll just set those up as like play one no trump so people just get a chance to learn how to take tricks. So these blue buttons will allow you to play uh, or play a preset auction one deal at a time. If you intend to do several deals in your set and you intend to go in order, you can upload your deal set. That'll bring up the first hand. Let me go back to this. You can also upload the deal set. I don't use preset tricks. I'm not going to talk about that. I might upload an entire deal set with a preset auction. You can just click on that. So if I upload the whole set back to my teacher's table, and I have finished talking about the hand and I'm ready for them to play the next hand, two forward arrows here, this will take me to the next hand automatically, and then the next hand automatically, so I don't have to go back to load deals every time and figure out which of these I want to play. If I upload the whole set, again, now I'm on the teacher's table, I can just advance forward depending which hand I want to play next. Um, and before, when we were in our sample class, I had you put together as partners, and then I separated you so everybody could declare. Again, that's our, our uh, uh, seating control box, which is right here. And I can switch this around during class. So I have people as partners right now. And this is a really nice thing about the program. If I separate these partners, to say give them a chance to declare and then I put them back together, they will go back with the partners they were with. All right, so say I want them to all play the hand, I'll put them all north and the program will automatically create enough extra tables so that everybody is north at their own table. And then when they're finished declaring, I can put them back with their partners, two per table, north, south, Okay, so if, uh, Mulder and Scully, are they back together? Yeah, they are. Okay, there are these two chat areas. Um, this classroom chat is where the students are talking to each other. This box, messages from students, is where I will see their comments if they use the question mark symbol. So if I could ask the students, any of you students, if you want to just send me a question um this so instead of having to look at zoom i can now see questions here in my messages from students does anyone have a question okay a question on how to undo thank you very much okay so i can kind of see these questions and i i kind of keep this box small because i don't really want to be bothered by all the chatter um, but i will see the questions here a few of you have asked what to do if a student gets disconnected. And what I tell them is just click on the link again and reconnect. Sometimes they actually get a disconnect message and it'll ask them to reconnect and that's all they have to do. Um, if the teacher gets disconnected and has to reconnect, the same thing happens. Everybody just goes back to the seat they were in before. It's actually pretty smooth. Disconnects do happen. Uh, because, you know, that's the internet. Um, so nobody panic, nobody get upset, just reconnect and you should go right back to where you were. Um, we found that the students are pretty tolerant of technical glitches. You know, they know it comes with the territory and that we're all still learning how to use online technology for bridge classes. So they're, they're pretty tolerant and they're pretty happy taking the class, even if there is a glitch. Final thing I just wanted to mention to you is that you can run a duplicate game if you want to as a way for students to practice. So down here on your control panel, uh, if you click on duplicate game, uh, you can set up a Howl, 
or Mitchell, match points or imps, number of boards, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not gonna go into that now, but it works really well. It's a nice feature if you're interested in doing something like that. Okay, so I think I have shown you the buttons that I wanted to show you. Um, can, the, can the chat be disabled? Uh, currently, no. Okay. I mean, you can always hide it away from the screen. Right. I, I could get rid of it. I could put this, you know, I could just get rid of it if I didn't want to see it. Um, yeah. Students have asked me that how can they erase the chat at their table because there may have been a lot of chatter and they yeah. find the messages that are popped up all over their screen are distracting. And somebody figured out the answer to that, which is that they click the paper airplane all the chat will go away and they'll have yeah, a clean if, table yeah. again. If, um, the type me if the message box is empty, like sending an empty message and you hit the paper plane, it clears. We didn't have enough space for a button. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, um, oh, um, now a couple more things. Um, Nancy asked me a good question about how to move around cards at the teacher's table. That's worth showing, especially when you're teaching beginners something like finesses. Okay, so again, I'm selecting the hand that's uh, showing right now. And since I'm going to talk to you about how to take a successful finesse, I'm going to play a preset auction. Okay, uh, I'm not going to have students bid. I'm just going to bring up the hand and have them play it. All right, so this hand has now been loaded to every student table, and it's now on my teacher's table. Um, and as we can see, all right, we have to finesse here in spades. So we win the ace of diamonds, and the point is that we have to take an immediate finesse. So as I'm explaining the finesse, I'll say, we're going to play our three of spades. And if south plays low, we're going to put in our jack. And whether our jack wins the trick all depends on who has the king. And if I want to, I can change the cards. And I can say, if, uh, if North has the king, your jack is going to lose. And now you might go down. But we'll go back. If the king is on the other side, and you lead a small one, and south plays low, and you put in your jack, it'll win. See, it all depends on who has the king. And that's why we say a finesse is a 50-50 chance. So how did I get the king here to move back and forth so I could show the students the different outcomes depending on who had the king? And that is a really cool thing. So the card that I want to move, I right click. So I rest my cursor on it and I right click. And then I move it up to where the card is that I want to replace in this case, the two of spades, and I right click. And now the king of spades and the two have changed places. And when I want to move them back, again, I click on right click on the king, come down here and right click on the two, and they change places again. So I think um, this would be a good uh, time to bring the official presentation to an end. Um, thank you all for coming. Okay, good luck, everyone.